Hi, this is Rick, and welcome to Astral Club. The title of this episode is Astral Journey to the End of the Earth. Now, usually I work off of an outline, and then I flesh that out as I go through um, the podcast. However, there are certain experiences that I have written down because they were so impactful or what I considered important that I wanted to make sure I'd written them down so that in detail, so that nothing would be forgotten. Um, Now, I have many time travels and space travels that we'll talk about in the future. Hopefully you'll enjoy them. Many of them have interesting characters that I've met. In this particular one, just want to give you a heads up right now, the main characters are yours truly, Rick, and a dying Earth. It's more, has a lot more in common with the movie Castaway than it does Star Wars. So, just want to give you a heads up. My second little piece of advice is time dilation at least my definition of it, is going to figure heavily in this particular experience and indeed in any of my time travel experiences. Now, for your scientists out there, I realize that how I'm applying it to the astral is not exact or is certainly not correct from a scientific standpoint, but there is no research in phenomena in the astral. So my only choice is to adopt similar concepts uh, from the physical. And in time dilation in the physical, and and this goes back to Einstein's theories, that as you travel close to the speed of light, time essentially slows down for that person who is traveling close to that speed of light. There's the old um, example that I saw as a kid in elementary school, where they showed a couple of twins, and one of them stayed on Earth, and another headed into a rocket ship to head towards uh, space, traveling at close to the speed of light. When he returns, he's still 25 years old. However, his twin, who he left behind on Earth, is now 70. So that's the scientific physical version of time dilation. I'm applying it to the astral because, as I said, no one with any kind of scientific knowledge has really bothered to come up with something better. So you're going to have to deal with somebody who's got um, a business degree and lots of astral experience to do his best at the science of, of this whole thing. What I have noticed in my time travels is that as I travel into the past, I'm a ghost. I can change nothing. I can view the past but the time that I can spend there is remarkably short. Um, the time I told you about traveling back to the large crocodilians somewhere around 75 million years ago, I can only spend mere minutes there. And when I got back, about 20 or 25 minutes had transpired in the physical. So let's say 10 minutes back at 75 million years ago and only in about 20 or 25 minutes here. So I could spend less time in the physical than actually I could have spent in the present. Now, as I go into the future, that changes. As I go into the future, my ability to actually physically interact on the physical plane dramatically increases. I adopt a body that is a physical shell. Now, it can be touched by individuals who are living in the physical world of the future. Now, that doesn't mean that anything else changes, though. I can't really feel their touch other than I can sense who they are and what they are by when they touch me. But I don't gain any physical senses. But I do gain a solidity so that I can interact with people in that future time. And even more importantly, I gain more time to actually interact with that future. In one particular trip, which I'll talk about in the future, I spent years, approximately 10 to 15,000 years in the future, with a tribe there, and I actually even um, married. And when I returned, no more than 20 or 25 minutes had passed here 
in the present. So, when I talk about time dilation in the astral, that's what I'm referring to. And so please, any scientists or people versed in that, please forgive me because I, I'm aware that I'm stretching this definition extremely far. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read my experience to you because I don't want to leave anything out. I'll probably depart at several points to make my own little comments uh, about what I'm reading here. So please bear with me. If it sounds like I'm reading it, it's because I am reading. But I don't want you to miss out on anything that, uh, that I'm discussing here. Okay, well... The whole idea behind this was I had traveled into the past, I had traveled into the future. But usually my trips were what I considered relatively short, 100 years here, 500 years here, 1,000 years here, 15,000 years there. I wanted to see if it was possible to make a far, far journey into the distant future. Um, I partially expected that it probably wasn't even possible but I decided I was going to give it a try. So I picked the arbitrary date of 500 million years into the future. And here is where our story starts. Before leaving my physical body, I had decided to travel to the distant future. I left my body and once free, I propelled myself like a tightly coiled and focused rocket to my destination, 500 million years into the future. I blacked out, which is very common when I project into the far future. However, when I came to, I found that I was lying on an arid plain. There was no signs of any greenery, birds, or even insect life. The ground beneath me had a red sandstone tint with gray granite cliffs in the distance. The sky was cloudless. My astral body cannot feel heat. And looking around at the landscape prompted me to issue a silent thanks for that disability because it looked very, very hot. Needing another perspective on my reality, I stretched my arms into the sky and willed myself into it. Um, in a blur of color and movement, I floated miles above the new earth. The familiar continents I learned in grade school were gone. Beneath me was a massive supercontinent with one large landlocked interior sea surrounded by a planet-wide ocean. My first thought was that I'd lost the Earth and hit another planet instead. However, my astronomy knowledge turned that thought aside. As I looked around, I spotted Venus and Mars, which were still in space coursing through our solar system. Of course, the moon was very easy to spot. And if you've ever traveled in space, you know that large moons like ours are fairly rare. So. It's not something you can easily miss. I noticed, though, that there were a few new large craters that I hadn't recognized from my previous moon visits uh, in the past. I decided on a planetary survey um, and uh, figured that my return signal, which was a feeling that I get, that it's time to return to my body, and sometimes there's an actual physical tug from the back of my head like someone is pulling a cord taut, pulling me back. I figured that that was going to be coming very soon, so I had better at least survey the Earth uh, before I was forced to return to my body 500 million years or so in the past. In fact, the reason I started experimenting with future travel was really as a way to duck or hide from this signal, thereby extending my astral trip. At this point, I had actually managed to stay out for 24 continuous hours once before. The astral body doesn't require sleep, while only 20 minutes had elapsed back home. I dove for the coastline of the ocean and the supercontinent, but pulled up as I saw the massive breakers hitting the coast. Every wave looked like a tsunami, 
The sky didn't look stormy, but I opted for a landing far enough inland that I could survey the coastline without undergoing the psychic trauma of being swamped by a skyscraper-sized wave. At any rate, I knew I could look for signs of land-based and oceanic-based life just by doing what people do today, which is walking the shore. If there's life in the water, some of it will end up beached on a shoreline eventually. As I landed near the shore, I noticed something remarkable. My foot made an imprint in the sandy soil. I had never made any physical impact on the physical landscape before. In my astral body, I'm usually the equivalent of a ghost or a phantom, sometimes seen but never heard, felt, or touched. I reasoned that another side effect of the extreme far travel had been to change the nature of my astral matter to allow for physical interaction with my surroundings. In the sand, I used my right hand to inscribe Rick was here in 10 foot letters. The future was lucky there wasn't a spray can to be had for hundreds of millions of years, or I would have probably made an imprint in an even more colorful and tacky way. The novelty of physical power at this level now available to me in the astral was a heady, intoxicating mixture. I continued my tireless walk for miles now, looking for any signs of life. I did find a decayed creature the size of my foot that might have been a jelly-type animal, but I couldn't positively, uh, positively ID it due to either my ignorance of taxonomy or its advanced state of decay. The sun set and rose on my first day. I had broken my previous continuous future travel record of 24 hours. I felt a surge of joy at my achievement, but the emotion was tempered by the expectation that the inevitable return signal beacon was probably already well on its way. I continued to walk the barren and alien shoreline, and a few more days passed, and I began to doubt my astral senses. How could there be no life left on Earth? Worse, why was I still here? Was something wrong? No answers were forthcoming to my questions. More days passed as I reached an area with volcanic vents spewing hot water vapor every few yards. I was in no danger, of course, but dodging them one after another relieved my doubt, worry, and boredom. Five minutes into my game, however, the ground gave way, and I was pitched head over heels into a dark, watery pit. Splashing about blindly, I became angry and frustrated. I pounded my fists furiously, raising splashes in the water and visible gashes into the mucky cave walls. Mucky, I thought. As my anger drained away, I was able to focus on brown, greenish algae growing on the hot, moist cave walls. Walls that I had just damaged, I realized, in horror. Here was the first real life I had encountered on my 500 million year journey and I had wounded it. I thought back to everything that had made my time travel trips worthwhile. It wasn't the places or the errors of time that made them treasured memories. It was the amazing biodiversity of the earth that I had encountered. It wasn't until my trek through endless desolation, completely and utterly alone, that I could truly appreciate the earth I'd known in the past. At that moment, I offered to stand guard over my only living kin, <laughs> the cave's simple plant life, until I could be recalled to my long lost physical form. I guess on some level, I think I hoped that my sacrifice would tilt the cosmic balance in my favor, allowing this solitary prisoner a parole back home to my beautiful green version of Earth. I maintained my visual above the underground pool for several weeks. 
I piled rocks over the broken surface entrance in an attempt to heal the damage I had done. If you have ever seen the Tom Hanks movie Castaway, you'd have a window into my state of mind at that point. The algae was my Wilson. I cared for it like a doting mother. On my twelfth day, a storm blew in. Waves, hundreds of feet in the air, were visible from my slightly inland position. Rain came down in hard sheets. For a full day and night, the sky and the ocean battered away at my isolated shore. In an unholy partnership, not seen since the famous flood tales of old. My astral shell shielded my body in armor of pure energy, even during the worst of the elemental assault. The single chink in my defense lay in a more subtle area, however, as the storm intensified its vigorous attack. Soon, my sanity slipped away from me like fine dry sand through my tightly clenched fingers. At times, I begged and pleaded for the storm to relent. At others, I cursed the dark waves and the clouds that threatened to submerge my new home and my fragile charges. I think I also cursed all the mothers that had ever borne the children of mankind, as their actions had led to my inevitable, intolerable, solitary suffering. Of course, it was mostly the chattering nonsense of a madman sick to his soul. When my mind could take no more, I simply shut down and curled into an impervious armadillo-like astral, astral sphere. The sun rose, the wind stilled, and my senses returned. I tentatively unrolled and opened my astral senses to receive new input. I found my underground cave had been scoured clean of all traces of organic residue. Bereft, I picked a direction and began my death march anew. That is end of part one. I will record part two in the conclusion of this adventure next week. I am very interested in your comments and questions, which I'm sure there'll be more than a few. I'll do my best to answer them without giving away the end of the story. If you liked this part one of Astral Journey to the End of the Earth, please hit the like button. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And I want to thank everyone. There's been a lot of folks who have, who are new subscribers now. And I want to welcome you, especially those from Reddit. And don't forget to hit that bell button, because that way you'll be informed every time I post a new podcast, and most especially part two of this podcast. Thanks, everybody. And I will see you on the astral plane.